Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 35th Memorial Rubio de Francia. Uh, as most of you already know, this is a annual seminar to honor the legacy of Rubio de Francia, who was a, an extraordinary harmonic analyst. And from what others say, also an extraordinary human being. Um, and we invite a, a like a prominent mathematician to give a talk. And this year we have the we are pleased to have Emmanuel Carneiro from ICTP, and he's going to talk about sharp restriction on uncertainty inequalities. So allow me to. <coughs> to give a brief introduction about Emmanuel. Uh, so Emmanuel got his PhD at the University of Texas Austin under the supervision of William Beckner and Jeff Jeffrey Waller in 2009. Then his first postdoctoral position was at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton for one year. And then Emmanuel worked one year outside the academia, but in a big company, but quickly he realized that he missed sharp inequalities. <laughs> so he came back to the academia and he moved to IMPA, Instituto de Matemática Fuga de Picada, in Rio de Janeiro where he was an associate professor for several years until 2018, when he moved to ICTP Trieste, where he's a currently a research scientist. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so about his math, I mean, it's difficult to describe Emmanuel in just one area of mathematics uh, because he's well versed in many but I could describe him as an analyst who likes to explore other areas uh, such as uh, partial differential equation, approximation theory, or number theory. Um, but I think there are like three topics in which he spent most of his time researching, and these are like sharp restriction uh, inequalities, but he will talk about it. Um, he's a world leading figure in this. And if I have to highlight a result, probably would be the one that he proved the, that the maximize, the constants are the maximizer for some restriction estimate with the LP norm. Uh, with it, not an even number, but that was the first time, right? That we found the maximizer with P different than an even number. And that was a joint work with uh, Diogo Oliveira Silva and Mateo Sosa. But well, that's just one. He has many, but he will talk about this later. So let's move to the next topic that is approximation theory, uh, where he has worked, he has several results on extremal approximation by entire function of exponential time to certain like real functions, right? And he, also the next topic is related with this, is he used these results to prove a, results in number theory. Um, so he used this stremal approximation result to prove among others, uh, some, uh, some results about the Montgomery pair correlation conjecture with concern with the number of, of ordinates of the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function. And also he worked, he used the approximation theory to 
to get some bounds on uh, the rate of growth of the uh, Riemann zeta function is related with the linear hypothesis. Uh, this is just two examples, but there's many, many results on this Riemann zeta function. Uh, uh, right. Research. Um, last topic is the that I want to mention is the the regularity theory for maximal operators. The roughly speaking, Emmanuel uh, investigated the the action of the house of leaderboard operator operator on certain uh, functional space um, and try to see if it improves the the improves or preserves or even destroys the priori regularity of the initial data the initial function um, where he work on many uh, many cases with the center and center, the discrete analog, the fractional one, the convolution one, has many <coughs> sharp results in this. Uh, and well, of course, outside this main topic, he has some other very nice results. Let me highlight his result on a Fourier optimization problem with used to improve bounds for prime gaps and also some results on Fourier uncertainty that we will talk about it later. Um, and yeah, and well, also let me mention that in addition to his outstanding research, he has always been committed to outreach activities with several public lectures and, and expository writing. And he also has, uh, I think, seven or already seven PhD students, right? Um, and yeah, so without further ado, uh, let me give the floor to Manuel. Thanks, Avi. Thanks for the lovely introduction. Uh, thanks, everyone, for the lovely invitation to be here. It's actually a big pleasure for me to be in Madrid one of the most spectacular places in the world, both as a city and for us analysts, you know, such a place with a magical history and analysis. Uh, thank you so much for, you know, I've learned so much from you, you know, from Rube de France and some of uh, the papers from people here, and I'm still learning. And as Javi mentioned, you know, I, I consider myself as, as an analyst. Uh, but I like to explore and I like to talk to people in, 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 in the neighboring fields of analysis. You know, for me, this is one of the beautiful things about analysis that perhaps it's the, the highlight, it's the, the main field in mathematics is, that has this property that you can talk to a lot of people in neighboring fields. Not only me, but I'm sure all of you can do it. Maybe you haven't explored it yet, but if you try a little bit, you'll see that it's, it's a lot of fun to talk to people in other fields, people that know more than you. And then suddenly, they can come up with some isolated problems in, in, in analysis that you can uh, understand a little bit more. So I, when I was planning for this talk, you know, I, it's hard to come here and uh, not too much, not talk about the, the restriction theory because this place is so fundamentally famous with the contributions from people here to restriction. So I, I kind of mixed my talk between two topics. Well, there is one common theme and the theme is this, sharp inequalities is the, is the search for extremal behavior of some objects related to the Fourier transform. So I plan, maybe I will talk a little bit about this uncertainty principles. And if I have time at the end, I will move to this sharp restriction theory. But if not, I, I have the slides and I'll give it to you if somebody wants to take a look at it later. All right, so just so I know, how many people here are not from analysis at all? Do we have algebraic geometers in the room? Number theorists? Okay, so we're fine. Everybody's an analyst here or understands. But I, okay, so first part of my talk, let me talk about the uncertainty phenomenon. And this is our guest of honor, Fourier, you know, French mathematician. He's 
honored with his name on one of the sides of the Eiffel Tower. It has 72 names of French scientists. Just as a curiosity, mathematics is very well represented there. We have 21 mathematicians. So next time you go there, you can search for some of your favorite mathematicians. Fourier is one of them. Uh, and I will start, as Keith suggested to me yesterday, you have to define the Fourier transport. So here's my definition of the Fourier transport. I told him, well, Keith, every time that I give a lecture, I define my Fourier transform. He said, sure, really? This is so unusual. Yes, because I like to say that I use this minus two pi here in the normalization of the Fourier transform. So this is the classical Fourier transform. First, define it for a function, which is in L1, and then you can uh, extend it you know, <coughs> to functions in L2 because it preserves the norm in L2. This is Plancharov's theorem. OK, so this is an isometry in L2. You have the Fourier inversion. So if you start with F, you can get F hat. But if you have F hat, you can recover F by just changing this minus to a plus. Is there something to point here? Yes. Okay. Um, well, this is the main object you know, that is used in mathematics to model all sorts of oscillatory phenomena in nature. OK, so the basis of telecommunication, signal processing is this object or something very closely related to it. Okay. So you might have heard this expression before in your life called Fourier uncertainty. I'm sure you heard this. And uh, to me, what it means is that one cannot have, it, it, it's a mathematical statement that essentially says the following. One cannot have an unrestricted control of a function and its Fourier transform at the same time. So any mathematical statement that encapsulates this philosophy to me is an uncertainty principle. You know, you have heard in physics, the physicists consider this, oh, you cannot localize the, the, the position and the velocity of a particle at the same simultaneously with a very sharp, accurate error. You know, this is how they think about it. Uh, for us mathematicians, there are several ways to, 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 to make this precise, you know. So a very uh, basic example, you know, for example, suppose you are in dimension one and I give you a Gaussian, f of x is a Gaussian, and I ask you, can you have f hat of zero, the Fourier transform at the point zero, to be any constant that I want? See, and you say, well, obviously not. Because if, I, if you give me the function, you already give me 100% of the information. So the other side is already given. So this number is going to be what it is. It's going to be one. OK, so you cannot ask it to be two. But suppose I give you the function, say that my function is a Gaussian just outside the interval minus one, one. Can you have f hat of zero being a constant of your choice? And then you have it, you know. I gave you a little bit more freedom on the physical side, and I asked for something on the fully transform side. This can happen, you know. So lots of problems that I've been working on over the past years with uh, my students, postdocs, are with this philosophy in mind. There are some sort of constrained Fourier optimization problems. You have some conditions on the function, you have some conditions on the Fourier transform, and you want to optimize a certain quantity that is usually related to maybe a problem in number theory, maybe a problem in, in partial differential equations. All right, so far, so good. I promised everybody would understand my first slide. I hope I accomplished my, my promise. Second slide as well, right? Fourier uncertainty, this is quite a popular thing. So if you search in Amazon, you'll see lots of books on this thing. You can buy the favorite ones. Some of them are written by physicists, you know, uh, so they have different focus, but they all talk about the same phenomenon that I just described. Very well. So here are some examples of <laughs> mathematical formulations of the uncertainty principle. So the first one, perhaps this one due to Heisenberg from 1937, that this is an inequality like this, you know? The L2 norm of a function is controlled by the L2 norm of f times x and f hat times xi. You know. So this is this is you can see from this statement that, that f and f hat cannot be. So suppose that the f is normalized, you have L2 norm one. Suppose that the left hand side is one. So you see that f and f hat cannot be very well localized around zero. Otherwise, this would be very small and this would be very small, violating this inequality. Okay, so this is one way to see this. Another one is due to Hardy uh, around 1933. So, if a function has a Gaussian decay e to the minus pi ax squared and the Fourier transform has also a Gaussian decay, the combination of this Gaussian decays, if it's too, too fast, you know, if this constant a times p is bigger than one, then the only function that verifies these things are zero. 
Okay? So in principle, for example, this principle already proves that you cannot have a function in a Fourier transform compactly supported. Okay. So here's a, another version of this thing. This is now due to Henri Berthier, 1977. If you give me two sets of finite measure in RD, then the L2 norm of the function is controlled by the L2 norm of F in the complement of the set and the L2 norm of F hat in the complement of this set. Okay. So another, you can also prove this like this, that the function and the Fourier transform cannot have compactly supported, cannot be compactly supported. Okay, so these are just three examples of many mathematical formulations of this phenomenon. By the way, stop me at any, any time that you want to intervene, okay? Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit to you about this phenomenon of uh, the sign uncertainty principle. And uh, <clears throat> for those of you who, might be familiar. This is going to be related to this uh, sphere packing problem that we have been hearing a little bit about over the last last years. Uh, so let me make a, a, a quick definition here. That's something that's going to pop up over the next minutes. This is a simple definition. I'm going to say that a function is eventually non-negative if it's eventually non-negative. If it does what the name says it does, right? So if uh, it's bigger or equal than zero, starting at a certain point, from that point on is bigger or equal than zero, okay? And I'm going to, to define this radius R of F, the radius of F, as being the point where it starts to be non-negative, okay? The infimum of all R such that F of X is non-negative from that R on. My functions are in RD, so from modulus of X bigger than R on. So here's an example of a function. It's a polynomial times a Gaussian, and the polynomial changes size at some points, but you know, starting at this point here, it becomes non-negative. So this is the, the radius of this function in this way, okay? So it's, if you want, it's the last sign change of the function. Very well. So <clears throat> in 2010, in this nice paper at the Anal the Institute for Year, Burgan, Kahan, and Closel uh, considered this, this nice, Fourier analysis problem in connection to a problem in algebraic number theory. They were trying to, they were using this thing to bound this discriminate discriminants of, of number fields. Uh, and the problem is, is, is relatively simple to state, you know. Let me give you a class of functions, which is the following. So my class, I'm going to call it this, a plus one of d. Uh, the notation will be more uh, apparent later. But these are integrable functions on our d which are continuous, even functions, real valued, okay? Such that the Fourier transform is also integrable. <coughs> so you get continuous functions, the Fourier transform is also going to be a continuous functions. They're even and real valued. Now, you ask for both F and F hat to be eventually non-negative, okay? And, and you put a competing condition. Well, although I, I ask them to be eventually non-negative, Although I ask f to be eventually non-negative, I'm going to ask for the integral of f to be non-positive. And same thing for f hat. I'm asking it to be eventually non-negative, but I'm asking for the integral to be non-positive. Okay? So go ahead, Jesus. Uh, yeah, why, why did you remove the zero from first? The zero is, is the zero is the zero function. Oh, okay. Sorry, it's 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 uh, yeah. L one. This is the zero function, not yeah. the zero point. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I should have put maybe a, a bold symbol zero. Okay. So these are the two things. So I want both f and f hat at infinity to be non-negative, but I want them to have a certain negative mass near the origin, such that their integrals are non-positive. Okay. So in some sense. I'm interested in the question, how much can I concentrate the negative mass of a function and its Fourier transform? This is the philosophy of this problem, okay? And, and we're going to measure this by defining this quantity, okay? I'm going to take the radius of F, since it becomes, since it's eventually non-negative, I define its radius of F. I take the radius of F hat, and I'm going to take the product of these two guys, okay? You can put the square root here just for, but what's, what's interesting is, is you want to minimize the product of these two radii over this class. Why the product? Well, because this is the quantity that's invariant under dilations. So if you just dilate your function, if you consider f delta of x to be f of delta x, you play this trick, this quantity here will be unchanged because on the Fourier transform side, this will revert. Okay, so this is actually the natural quantity to be evaluated and it's invariant under dilations. 
And the question is, can this be as small as you want? Go ahead, you had a question. Well, what is uh, the, can you remind me of what the radius is again? The radius is the, the less the sign change of the function, right? So it's the point right, where right. the function starts to be no negative. Okay. So the question is, can you make this object as small as you can? Can you make them very, very much concentrated near zero? Okay. And uh, the answer is no. So Bourgain, Kahan, and Clozel, they proved that this quantity here, so the class is uh, uh, italic A. This is uh, the constant, the value of the sharp constant, this influence, I'm gonna call it this big A plus one of B. Uh, so they proved that this is actually bounded by below, by a constant, which is roughly uh, comparable to the square root of the dimension. So we are in dimension D. So this lower bound here is an uncertainty principle, okay? We cannot make this, uh, this uh, negative mass be very concentrated in the, at the origin in this sense, okay? So this is what is, became known as sign uncertainty principle for the Fourier transform. All right, so here's an example. So you take a function, take your favorite function, let's say f is the sum of two Gaussians plus another sum of three Gaussians here. So you see the function looks like this. This is the radius of f, the, the last sign change when it becomes positive. This is the radius of f hat, the Fourier transform. And you want the product of these two guys. So you want it to minimize these things. Okay. Are those both in chat? Mm, well, this is what I'm going to talk about. No, they are not necessarily sharp, okay? This is just a lower bound. This is an upper bound. They have the same order of magnitude, square root of D. So the order of magnitude, except for the implied constant is okay, but these are not sharp. Uh, I'll come back to that in five minutes. All right. <clears throat> so let me, I'm going to give one proof to you in this talk. And this proof is going to be of this result. How do we prove this result? Okay. You will all <coughs> get it and understand it with me. So the first thing that you have to do you have to symmetrize, do a symmetrization of your situation. Okay, you have to reduce to eigenfunctions here. So you started with this family where you had f and f hat, and you had these conditions here. Now, what you will do is that since this quantity that you want to minimize is invariant under dilations, if you start with a function and it's fully transformed, you will do an appropriate dilation to put their radii, the, 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 the less sign change, at the same point. Okay, so you can choose an appropriate dilation. You can rescale such, and you can assume without, option, without loss of generality that the radius of F is the same radius of F hat. Now, when you do this, you sum the two functions. Okay, you consider W to be F plus F hat. What do you gain? Well, this W is an eigenfunction of the Fourier transform, right? If you apply a Fourier transform to this W, you get F hat plus F hat hat, and F hat hat gets back to F because F was even. Okay, so, and of course, if both of these functions are non-negative from that R on, of course, their sum will be. So the radius of this W is at most the radius of the original F, which is the same as I had. So bottom line is that this W does a better job than the function F that you started with. So without loss of generality, you can just consider this problem for the class of eigenfunctions of the Fourier transform with eigenvalue one. The Fourier transform is a unitary operator that has four eigenvalues. This will be important later. One minus one, i, and minus i. These are eigenfunctions with eigenvalue one. Okay, so let me now consider the subfamily, which I'm gonna put a little star here. It's the same family, but just now with the eigenfunctions. So F L1, except the zero <coughs> function, continuous, even real value such that F is an eigenfunction. F hat is equal to F. Okay, now the, the two conditions become just one now. I want f to be eventually non-negative, and I want its integral to be non-positive. And now you want to just minimize the radius of f under the circumstance, right? That's why I had the square root in the beginning. Now it becomes just the infinite. And that the answer for the original problem, we have seen it's equal to the answer of this problem restricted to this, to this class. Here's an example, my function f. This is an eigenfunction of the Fourier transform. It does this, and it has the radius at this point. This is not a sharp example, just an illustration of the, of the phenomenon, okay? Questions so far? Are we good? All right, so here's the proof. The proof is a few lines. The proof is quite simple. Let F be in this 
restricted eigenfunction class and set R to be the radius of F. I'm going to decompose F in its uh, positive part and the negative part. So F is going to be F plus, where F is positive, minus F minus, where F is negative, okay? Okay, so one of the, you have two competing conditions. The one that F is non-negative at infinity, but the integral is non-positive. So you start with the integral. The integral is non-positive. Zero beats the integral. The integral of F is the integral of the positive part minus the integral of the negative part. Okay, very good. So if you move this integral of the negative part to the right, you get an inequality. But now we're gonna use the following. This is the Hausdorff-Yang inequality, or essentially the definition of the Fourier transform because F is an eigenfunction. So F hat is equal to the integral of F against that exponential, you just move the integral inside. So the infinity norm of F hat, which is F, loses to the integral of F, modulus of F. And the integral of modulus of F is the sum of the positive part and the negative part. But, you know, the negative part, if I move this to the right, beats this positive part. So this is less than or equal than two times the negative part. But I am assuming that my negative part lives where? Lives in the ball, BR. And this is less than or equal than two times the infinity norm of the function times the volume of the ball. Voila, you cancel this thing and you get the, the volume of the ball has to be bigger than a half. Therefore, the radius cannot be very small. That's the proof. Okay, so I check that every talk has to have a proof. This is a proof, <laughs> okay? So this was later refined by Felipe Gonçalves, Joe Oliveira Silva, and Stefan Steinerberg in 2017. They provided refined estimates, including those upper and lower bounds of Bougain, and they, pro and they proved the existence of extremizers. There's a function that is an extreme function. We'll be back to that later. All right. Now, let me talk about this dual sign uncertainty principle. And things will start to become more interesting. So this is a paper of Henry Cohn and Felipe Gonçalves, which was not our student at APA. There's a paper published in Inventions in 2019. And they consider uh, a, 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 a dual problem in the following sense. Now, let me take S to be a sign plus or minus one. And I'm going to consider the same family, A, S of D. So here I had plus one before. Now the notation is starting to make sense. I have A, S of D functions, F, L1, continuous, even real value, such F hat is integrable. Now I want F and S, F hat to be eventually non-negative, okay? And the competing condition is that their integrals are non-positive. So I want the integral of this guy non-positive and the integral of this guy non-positive. And I ask the same question. Define this constant big A S of D as the infimum of the product of the radii of these two functions, which are eventually non-negative, R of F and R of S F hat. And you can ask if this thing can go to zero, okay? When S is plus one, it's just the original problem. When S is minus one, this is the, the, the dual problem that arises now, okay? You want F to be eventually non-negative and, my, and minus F hat to be eventually non-negative. It's a little bit of a different situation. But nevertheless, you can reduce the problem to eigenfunctions in the same way that we did before. So you may assume that F hat is equal to SF. So it, it appears the eigenvalue minus one here. And they proved in this paper, the same sort of bounds that Bourdain, Kahane, and Corzell had proved. That this constant here, in both cases, one and minus one, is bounded by below by a constant times square root of t. So there is also a sign uncertainty principle here. This is uncertainty from the bottom. But, of, but you know, the proof is, is, uh, is, 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 is similar to what I showed you in the last slide. And you may ask, well, uh, so here's an example. Uh, of a function that does this job, that f hat is equal to minus f, you know? Uh, so this is a function that, that uh, starts positive, becomes negative, and this is the last sign change. So this is the radius of this function, and, uh, and the Fourier transform is minus this function. So here's another example in your dimension one. You have a function f, and you have uh, f hat like this. Here's the, the point where it becomes positive, Here's the point where f hat becomes negative or minus f hat becomes positive, it actually becomes zero. 
This turns out to be an extreme example in dimension one. We're going to discuss a little bit more. So let me comment a little bit on this, uh, on this connections of this problem with the sphere packing problem, <laughs> which is, you will see how it uh, comes to, 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 to show up this connection. The sphere packing problem, you might all be familiar with. It's the problem of how many spheres can you put on the Euclidean space RD? What's the densest packing? <laughs> How can you pack your spheres in the densest possible way to cover the biggest portion of the space, right? This is the densest known packing. Uh, this is the densest proved packing in, in dimension two so with the lattice points in the hexagon. And this is the, the densest packing in dimension three, the way that we put the oranges in the, in the, in the, on the supermarket, right? Here's the, the density of this packing. If this covers 90% of the space, this covers 74% of the space. So there was a very nice breakthrough over the last years about the sphere packing problem, uh, <coughs> which goes like this, you know? So there was a Fourier analysis. Uh, there was a Fourier analysis approach to this problem, uh, uh, which was the following problem. You know, it's, it's kind of similar to what I've been describing to you, but uh, and Elkis, and independently Gorbachev in the early 2000s, they, they came up with this approach to give bounds for the sphere packing problems in all the dimensions. They said the following, you know, if you can construct a function G, which is not identically zero, such that G and G hat are even real value and integrable, G of zero and G hat of zero are positive. Now G changes sign, it's negative when X is bigger than R, and G hat is, is always no negative. So it's a, it's a positive definite function, okay? So if you can construct a function like this, every time you construct a function like this for some R, you have a bound for the sphere packing density in terms of this R here on the right-hand side. So the, the smallest R you can construct such a function, the better upper bound you'll have for the sphere packing, okay? And uh, what turns out to be true is that there were two special packings in, in dimension eight and 24, such that the bounds coming from this, because you can construct these functions using optimization things and computational tools, the, 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 the packing in dimension eight and dimension, uh, this uh, E8 lattice in dimension eight and this leech lattice in dimension 24, they were getting very, very close to the bound coming from this problem. Very, very close, how much? Well, up to 20 decimal digits. You know, so it was kind of conjecture that in these two dimensions, one could actually construct the extremal function for this problem uh, to actually prove that these two packings were the best possible packings. And this is what the Vyazovska did in 2017, dimension eight, and her and, and, and her collaborators, Kohn, Kumar, Miller, and Radchenko did in dimension 24. Now, what's the connection between this problem and the ones that I've been describing to you? The way that they approached this problem was to subdivide it into two. And one of these two is actually our problem with the, with the sign of minus one. Because if you consider a function G for this problem here, and you consider G hat minus G, call this F, this will be a function F in the class that we discussed here, the class minus one. This is a, an eigenfunction with sign minus, minus one with eigenvalue minus one. And this belongs to the class because if you subtract G from G hat from G, this will be no negative starting at R, okay? So this belongs to this class and the radius of this function is smaller than this R here, okay? So these two problems are connected and this is actually what became a little bit more special about this problem. It's actually, okay, I showed you how the uncertainty principle works. There is a lower bound. This cannot go to zero. And you ask, well, but are these things extreme? No, the extremal things are actually very delicate. And the extremal values are only known in four cases. And these are the four cases. You know, uh, as a consequence of the papers from the sphere packing, you get the sharp constants for the minus one uncertainty principle in dimension one, eight, and 24. And these are one square root of two and two. Okay, this is a corollary of the, of the things that were written on the sphere back and forth. And this is actually the highlight of this paper of Cohen and Gonzalez, you know, to actually find the sharp constant of the original problem of Bourdain, Kahan, and Closel in another dimension, in dimension 12. And the value is square root of two. So this means that this thing 
cannot be less than square root of two, and there is one and exactly one function that does the job. Uh, I'll show you what the extremal function is. Now, there are very interesting conjectures. For example, the, the original Burgan Kahan and Clausel problem in dimension one is actually very much complicated. Uh, it's not known what the value of the sharp constant is. It's conjectured to be this one related to the golden ratio, but we have no idea how to prove. The, the sphere packing problem in dimension two, it's already proved that the best lattice is this hexagonal lattice, but it was not proved. The proof is different. It's not by these Fourier analysis methods. If one could prove that the value of this constant, a minus one or two is this one, one could prove the sphere packing problem with these tools as well. You know, this could be used for also to other problems in point minimization with potentials as well on the way. Okay, there's a recent paper of Gonçalves, Oliveira, Silva, and Ramos, which extends this plus and minus one sign uncertainty principles that I just described to you to, to a suitable operator setting. Well, you could do this with Fourier series, the function of torus and the Fourier series, you know, and do the same philosophy and, and, and more general operators. So just as a curiosity, I'm gonna pass this slide very quickly. The, the, the construction of these extremal functions lies at the interface of analysis and number theory and uses this theory of modular forms. So just so you know what's the sharp the sharp function for uh, dimension 12 for this uh, Bourdain Kahan and Clausel principle, this is this thing. You consider these three theta functions, these are the usual theta functions theta 0, 0, theta 0, 1 given by this, and theta 1, 0 given by this. Consider this function here, which is a modular form. This is in the upper half plane. Now you let this function psi be this function to the fourth power, this function to the fourth power, and this function to the 12th power, divided by this delta, and this f here, blah, this is your extremal function. That does the job. So you integrate this function psi from 0 to infinity over the vertical line, psi of it have to subtract some appropriate terms against the Gaussian, and you have the sine square of pi x square over two. You know? This is actually very big, this, this function, it's crazy. How do people come up with this thing? Well, if you look at the formula for a little bit, you see the sine pi square of something, you see that this, this function wants to have roots at the points square root of 2n, okay? So this is why this thing is here. Uh, and then you multiply by something, but this is kind of the trick. The function wants to touch the zeros as square root of two n. And this enter in another business. This is how these functions were constructed because the people knew from the lattice conditions in the sphere packing, they knew where the interpolation points should be. So my function should do this job, but it should be touching the zeros at the point square root of two n. And this gives a hint on how to construct these extremal functions. And what Biazowska did was to introduce this machinery of modular forms into the game. It's a very brilliant idea. Okay, now <clears throat> for the next minutes, and maybe this will be the last part of my talk, but I want to talk to you about the, a generalized sign for the uncertainty principle. You know, this is a work I did last year with my former student, Oscar Quezada Herrera from Ipa. So we started looking at this problem because one question, one thing caught our attention, you know. Because these uncertainty principles, they were there in the market for the eigenvalues one and minus one. So we just asked, you know, what about the eigenvalues plus and minus i? Can't you say anything about it? You know, there should be a, a principle that corresponds to these guys. So the goal, our, but our project kind of evolved and we ended up investigating the situation, a much more general situation. You know, this is when you, this is what I find beautiful about mathematics. You start to do a project to do something and you end up doing something almost uh, completely different, you know? But this is how things evolved. And we ended up studying the situation where you want the sign of F and F hat to resonate with the given generic function P at infinity. You know, in the previous situation, I just want my functions to be non-negative at infinity. So remember, we are in RD. Now I'm going to give you a generic function P. P can be any function of your choice. And I'm going to investigate the problem where f and f hat have the same sign of this function p at infinity, okay? Of course, I, I'm gonna put a competing weighted condition, you know, so it makes sense to have an optimization problem. So this function p will be the sign at infinity, and at the same time, it will be the weight in the competing condition. 
And everything that happened before that I showed up to now is going to be the case P equals one, the identity, the function identity equal to one. Okay, so let me, we're gonna have to set up some ground rules to, to break the ice, to start the problem, okay? So I'm gonna try to be as economical as possible. I'm going to ask my function P, let P be a measurable function. You're gonna to have to ask that it's locally integrable because you're gonna be integrating P. So you have to ask that it's locally integrable. This doesn't make any harm, but I'm going to assume also that P is either even or odd, okay? Because I want to talk about real valued functions, F and F hat. So I'm gonna to have to ask this thing about P. So P is gonna be an even or odd function. And this, this fractal R, this crazy R here, it's gonna be the parameter that says that P is even or odd. When R is zero, P is even. When R is one, P is odd. So P of minus X is minus one to this R P of X, okay? Keep these two conditions in mind. You're gonna put two conditions now that I'm gonna make it disappear later. These are the conditions P3 and P4 that I put here. So P is gonna to have to be, is annihilating in the following sense. If a function L1 is a continuous eigenfunction of the Fourier transform, and P times F is eventually zero, a function that is eventually zero, then the function F has to be identically zero, okay? For example, if the set P of X is, this is not harmful at all if my function P of X is different from zero, uh, if the set where it is different from zero is dense, this is, this is annihilated. And the, the condition P4 is homogeneous, that my function P is homogeneous, so there's a, a real number gamma such that P of delta X is delta to the gamma P of X. Put these two conditions just for a moment. I'm gonna remove them because, and then this is gonna be the generalized problem. Let S be a sign, plus and minus one, and you consider the family. A, S is the sign, P is my resonant function, dimension D. A, S, P, D, functions in a one, continuous, real valued, such that they are either even or odd, according to the, sign if, if p is even or, or odd okay so if p is even f i'm going to require even if p is odd f is going to be odd i'm going to ask that everybody is in a one f is in a one f hat pf and pf hat is in a one this is p times f hat okay it's not the Fourier transform of pf it's p times f hat so i'm going to ask these two functions pf and pf hat times s times f Correct. This is the corrected eigenvalue thing. I'm going to ask this function and this function to be eventually non-negative. Okay, so I'm prescribing the sign of f and f hat at infinity. I'm going to ask that these functions be eventually non-negative. Observe that if, uh, if, uh, if r is zero, if p is even, this is not here, and this is the problem as before. But if r is one, if the function p is odd, if f is real valued, f hat will be purely imaginary, okay? So purely imaginary will cancel with this minus i here. So we're really talking about real valid functions everywhere, okay? And I'm gonna ask the competing conditions. Well, this is eventually non-negative, but the integral is non-positive. And this is eventually non-negative, but the integral is non-positive. And I'm gonna ask the same question. Well, how small can you make the negative mass of these two functions? Define as the radius of this, the radius of this, take the infimum of the product. We can do the same symmetrization procedures as we did before. So I'm gonna use I'm gonna use dilations to assume that these two functions have the same radius, and this is gonna use the homogeneity property P4. And once I assume that they have the same radius, I can just add them up. I can add this function f and this function here, s minus i to the r f hat, to produce an eigenfunction that does a better job. And this is going to use that condition P3, okay? So these conditions P4 and P3 that I put at the end are just to take the general problem and reduce it to an eigenfunction problem. Have, have, having that in mind, I, I can define this generalized eigenfunction problem. Now, it's the same thing with the star, meaning that it's just for eigenfunctions. So let's start it again. F integrable, continuous real value such that F hat is an eigenfunction with this eigenvalue. P times F is in a one. I want P times F eventually non negative. And I want the integral of P times F to be non positive. So these two functions compete. And I want to minimize the radius of this guy. So I want to know when the sign of F can start being like the sign of P. So it's this, because 
for this to be eventually no negative is the same thing as saying that F and P have the same sign. When, how soon can this resonance happen? Now with this eigenfunction formulation, you can just forget about those conditions P3 and P4 if you start with this problem and you can just assume the first conditions P1 and P2, which were uh, harmless. One is that P is locally integrable and the other one is that P is even or odd. So this is essentially as free as it gets, you know, as general as it could get. Now, you can ask me, Emmanuel, well, th there are some very subtleties about this problem. You can say, why is this class of functions even non-empty? You're taking out the zero function here, right? Why is there a function which is not zero that actually verifies these things? You know? That is actually part of the problem. It's not clear that this is non-empty. So part of our first theorems in this paper is to actually give some conditions to, as to when this class is actually non-empty, that we can actually start doing things. But when the class is non-empty, can you prove an uncertainty principle for this? Can you prove that this infimum is not zero? This is the uncertainty principle for this problem. And if you can prove an uncertainty principle, can you actually talk about some sharp constants? Maybe, okay? So let me give you some examples. Take the function P of x1, x2, xd, so we are in D dimensions, to be x1. Okay, so I want my function, just the first coordinate. I'm gonna show to you, for instance, that the solution for this problem with the sign plus one in dimension 22 is two. Take this other polynomial here, four variables, this crazy polynomial that is on the board. I can also show to you that the solution for this problem with sine plus one in dimension four is exact and it's square root of two. So the nice thing about uh, this thing that in my opinion, the highlights is that we're able, if, even in such a rough environment with some, some very, very general conditions of this function, we're able to talk about sharp constants in some very specific situations, okay? And uh, this is perhaps the, the highlight result of this paper that I'm describing, you know? We're able to find on top of the four sharp constants that I mentioned to you before for the original problem and its dual version, we're able to find another set of 17 sharp constants associated to different functions P, okay? And these are described here. In essence, you know, you start with an R, so you start with an, with an L, and you consider this R of L to be congruent to L modulo two, so R of S is either zero and one. So, so we can solve these problems for this sign in this dimension, eight minus two L, with any function P, which is the product X1 up to XL, the product of the, the coordinate functions. And if you want, you can actually rotate. R is actually any rotation in this dimension. So the crazy polynomial that I showed to you was just the function X1, X2, X3, X4 with a proper change of variables that became that crazy polynomial, okay? So you can just plug in in your L here, for example, if you want to plug L equals one here, you get something in dimension six or the function x1 and then with a certain side. If you want to put L equals one here, you get something in dimension 10 uh, for the function x1 with a certain sign. And these are the exact answers. So these are 17 new shot constants for this problem. Uh, and and, and the, the, the idea to get this is not, we don't use modular forms in this paper. We actually borrow the constructions that we had from this original form and we find a mechanism to transfer sharp constants in one dimension to sharp constants in another dimension with a different weight function P. This is the trick. Okay, so it's more of an analysis paper than the number theory paper. But this is essentially the, the schematics of the paper, you know. Uh, this paper has two parts. The part on the left is essentially our best attempt to reproduce the, the, the philosophy of Burgan, Kahan, and Closel, that proof that I showed to you in the previous slide, you know? That proof reduced to eigenvalues, used the Hauser-Fiang inequality to prove that the ball could not be small, and you cancel something. Well, this is our best understanding on how to put this in a general framework with the same ingredients to reproduce that proof, okay? So we might have a theorem to say that the classes are non-empty, that you're not talking about the empty class. So there's genetic sufficient conditions to show that the class is non-empty. And there is this 
this admissible admissibility condition on the function P that will play the role of the Hausdorff-Young inequality in the original proof. And the thing is, if you have the class non-empty and this function P being admissible in a certain suitable sense, you get the sign uncertainty principle. You get that there is a bound from below. But there is a different mechanism, which we call dimension shifts. That is actually perhaps the, 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 the most novel part in this paper which is a, is a different mechanism in this one to find also proof that if you have the sign uncertainty in one dimension, you can translate it uh, to the sign uncertainty principle in another dimension, okay? And in some cases, you can make this into an equality and get the, the sharp values from the ones that you knew before. This is particularly useful when you're dealing with uh, weights, that weight function P, that have singularities at the origin. So if you get the, let's say, modulus of X to the minus two, so it's, it's something that is singular at the origin. It's integrable if the dimension is big enough, but it does not fit in this framework on the left. It fits on the framework of, on the right to deal with singular weights. So let me just go quickly to you through a, a, a sample of this result. So if you want to know, for example, what sort of theorems we proved in this paper, uh, this is a theorem about non-empty classes, you know? So when is the, this crazy class that you define non-empty? Well, here's, one example of condition, you know? if you take P such that P against uh, any Gaussian integrates, I think a P that if I put the Gaussian, it integrates, it's in L1. Assume that P is a harmonic homogeneous and harmonic polynomial H times a function Q, which is eventually non-negative. So you can take any homogeneous and harmonic polynomial of any degree, multiply by eventually non-negative function Q. And then this class here is going to be non-empty. You see, you can already construct lots and lots of examples, but in any Q here, measurable function, as long as it's eventually non-negative. Here is, is morally what plays the role of the Hauser-Fiang inequality in the proof, you know, this admissibility condition, you know? You need essentially a condition that says like this, if a function is in a one and it's an eigenfunction of the Fourier transform, and if this PF is in a one, then, the L1 norm of PF controls some LQ norm of F, okay? So this is kind of an admissibility condition, you know? And you have this and you need to have some decay where either P in LQ prime lock, or if Q is equal to one here, you need to have some limit of this, of this L infinity norm over little balls going to zero, okay? So this is the, 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 the thing that will play the role of the house of Young inequality in the proof and the, uh, for example, sufficient conditions to have this thing, to have admissibility. If you take any function P such that the sublevel set, if you take a sublevel set P of X less than lambda, if any sublevel set, if not any, but if A, if one sublevel set has finite Lebesgue measure, then we are in business. So you can take any function that has a sublevel set with a finite measure. So if your function P is, 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 is growing at infinity, you would be in good shape. Okay, so you see, uh, and then the theorem is that assume that the class is non-empty and that P is admissible, then the uncertainty principle holds. That constant that we define is bounded by below by a universal thing. Okay. So this is the left thing, you know? We get some generic conditions for non-empty classes. We get some generic conditions for admissibility, but this error is not if and only if. We cannot find, we were not able to find necessary and sufficient conditions for this thing. So there are other examples that don't fit in here that produce non-empty classes. And there are other examples that don't fit in here that produce admissible P. But if you have these two things, you get the sign of certain. The other slide is big, but I want to take a moment to go with you because this is perhaps, I will stop here. This is gonna be my last slide. Uh, this is the dimension uh, shifts mechanism. Let me just uh, explain to you briefly what it is. So <clears throat> it's gonna allow you to pass from dimension D plus two L to dimension D. So you start with L, no negative anything. And this R of L again is, is zero or one. It's just congruent to L modulo two. And you start with the function P in the R D plus two L. But P is radial. So I'm, I'm talking about radial functions. Verify that annihilating condition P3 technical that, that I defined before. Start, think about the radio function in dimension 2L, D plus 2L. Now you write this radio function 
you write it as P0 of modulus of X. So P0 is just the, the radial version of it. Now consider another function, P tilde in RD, defined as this P tilde is going to be P0, P0 of modulus of X, multiplied by a function H and a function Q. This H is a non-zero homogeneous and harmonic polynomial of degree L. And this function Q is an even or negative function homogeneous of degree zero, <laughs> okay? And the theorem, the first part of the theorem says, if you started with some, some class non-empty, then the class on the bottom, dimension D for this function P tilde with this uh, new sign is also non-empty and you get a, an inequality. You get always an inequality. The value here in the, in the upper class in dimension D plus two L is bigger or equal than the value in this dimension D, okay? So why is this inequality useful? Well. If for some reason you had the uncertainty principle here, you had this as bigger than something, then you get that uncertainty principle for this guy. <clears throat> a second part of the theorem is this. If P has bounded sublevels, has a bounded sublevel set, okay, if P has one bounded sublevel set, if this function Q is identically one, and the function H, which is supposed to be the homogeneous and harmonic polynomial of degree L, is just the polynomial x1, x2, up to xl. This is an homogeneous polynomial of degree L. We multiply the first L coordinates. Well, you're allowed to take any rotation that you want. In this condition, the equality here holds. And this is how we can translate sharp things that we knew here before to sharp things with other weights in other dimensions. So this is how we produce those 17 sharp examples from the four that we had originally, okay? So this is good for these two things. One is to produce the sharp examples, have been equality, and it's also useful to deal with singular weights that I told you, you know? If you're dealing with a power weight, say X to the lambda, with a singular a singularity at the origin, uh, X to the gamma, gamma negative, you would, you, you would do this process, choosing this function Q to be this thing here, X to the L, sine of h over h, okay? And you would essentially produce a function, uh, if you start in dimension d plus two l, you would produce a function d without this singular weight, you know? If you take q like this, uh, this q observe that is x to the l over h. So h is homogeneous of degree l. So you have x to the l, homogeneous of degree l. So this is homogeneous of degree zero, great. This is even, this is not negative because it's sine of h over h everything. But what happens when you multiply this Q here by this H? Well, the H in the denominator cancels, so you're essentially multiplying by X to the L. You're multiplying your original function by X to the L. Well, if you had a, a singular thing, you have X to the lambda, gamma, X to the gamma, gamma negative. When you multiply by X to the L, you get something with L plus gamma in the other dimension, and L plus gamma is positive. So this is how you win, okay? So I, I will conclude putting again, I mean, this, this nice corollary that we have to move the sharp constants in different dimensions. Well, as I said, I had maybe a few more slides, a second part of the talk to talk a little bit about the sharp restriction, but I think this is enough for the day. I'm gonna leave the slides here if you want to take a look at it. There are also some interesting open problems that I wanted to leave it written for the record. You can take a look, especially the graduate students in the audience. It's a very fruitful and nice topic of research as well. Anyway, I think it's enough for today. I will conclude it here and I will thank you guys very much for the kind attention and the lovely invitation, okay? No one has to... Um, can you give an idea why you use uh, homogeneous and harmonic polynomials? The answer is to use this uh, Bockner's relation, right? And this uh, Fourier transform. If you have a Fourier transform of uh, of uh, of uh, of uh, a radial function times a harmonic polynomial in one dimension, this is related to to the Fourier transform of this function in a dimension, which is D plus the degree of this harmonic polynomial, okay? And this is how it comes into play, this, 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 this homogeneous harmonic polynomials to use this, uh, this, 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 this formula. 
this is actually an important ingredient of the paper. Your intuition is very right to, to pinpoint that, okay, why is this relevant? I think that confused about my intuition. <laughs> <laughs> Can you briefly explain to us why 8, 24, or 12 are special for your computation? Well, 8, 24, and 12 were special, not exactly for my computation, but for the computation of the, 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 the colleagues that worked on this sphere packing problem before, right? And the reason is that uh, As I mentioned to you, I mean, I might have mentioned in the talk, you know, they, they formulated this, this upper bound for the sphere packing problem via Fourier analysis, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and they compare. So, so, so what they did was this: they they, they, they considered this Fourier analysis problem mm -hmm. for each solution that you have for this problem for any function that verifies these conditions, you get a bound for the the best density in all in, in in each dimension, right? So what they did was extensive computations in dimensions from one to 32, 37, you know, the first 30, 35 dimensions, they did computations to find numerically functions that verifies this rigorously, but the uh, experimental functions. So they, they get in each of these dimensions, some, some upper bounds, okay? And the graph was, the graph was uh, something like this, you know, if you put in a log scale, so they would have the, let's say dimensions one to 32, they would have some graph here with, the, with, this, uh, with this upper bounds. And they compared with the, so this, this was the upper bounds. And they compared with the best known packings. In each dimension, there are some lattice packings. You know, you can consider, for every lattice, you can consider a packing, mm -hmm. the lattice, you know. And so the best known packings will always be low, but, but what happens that in dimension, eight, there was a very good packing here. And then I mentioned 24, there was a very good packing here too. It was doing almost what they, they were getting as an upper bound. So, so, so they sort of, they conjecture, of course, this number was, was known, right? It's just the, this particular lattice, the density of this particular lattice. So this number was maybe two, this number was the square root of two. So they conjectured that, with this method, you could get the right upper bound. You could prove that the, the density of any packing was less than this number in these dimensions. If you could construct a function that gets the exact value for the upper bound, you would have solved the sphere packing, right? Because there were lattices with that density and you were proving that any lattice has a density smaller than this or equal to. And then, so, so, but this was in 2003. So it took maybe 15 years for, 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 for this team to actually come up and write down the magic functions. The theorem is these functions that verifies this when R is the square root of two in dimension eight exist. Here is the function. The function that does this in dimension 24 when R is two exists. Here is the function and they do. Therefore, we solve the sphere packing problem in these dimensions. In no other dimensions, the, the known packing is come close to the bound. So it's, it's not reasonable to assume that this is gonna be the way how to solve the problem in dimension four, for example. You know, might be new, new ingredients are needed there. And in the, in, for this uh, dimension 12, so the sphere packing problem is related to the sign uncertainty with minus one. The sign uncertainty with the plus one in dimension 12 turned out to be a very nice, uh, Let's say all the stars aligned so you can get a beautiful thing in dimension 12. They were able to get the Poisson summation formula uh, coming from modular forms as well that would prove that you know, the best solution was uh, at uh, least big or equal than square root of two. And then they constructed a function that matched exactly these things. And the tools for constructing the function was the same tools, the same sort of technical lemmas with modular forms that go in this, in this sphere packing papers. This is, and uh, we don't know of any other dimension where the, this, this would be achieved, at least for the original problem. For some reason, I, I, I with, the, with the weights, with this weight, weighted setup, the first weight that people, that, that came to my mind was the weight x squared. Because if you take a function, 
and multiply by x squared. On the Fourier transform side, this becomes a Laplacian, right? So it's normal to consider modules of x squared. You have a, you have a nice interpretation when this weight is a polynomial in terms of the derivatives of the Fourier transform. You can rewrite the problem that I wrote in terms of f and the Laplacian of the Fourier transform and so on. And <clears throat> we did extensive simulations until we arrived at the dimension that the, the answer was what wanted to give the answer to. I had a student doing computing simulations day by day for weeks and getting two, 2.001, 2.0001. And one day he came to me and said, Emmanuel, I got a simulation that gave me 1.9996. And I asked him, do you trust your simulations? I mean, did you check the error terms or are this, is this formal? And he said, yes, I trust it. I said, okay, so I trust you. Let's give up on this problem. It's, the answer is not two, so we have no idea what it is. <laughs> so as I told you, I mean, for these things to happen, very few things, very lots of things have to align. You know, I mean, the number has to be beautiful. There has to be some structure. You know, people who have worked in this room in sharp inequalities know that lots of happy coincidences have to happen in order for you to get the, the global estimate. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, a conjecture of which are the happy number for which you <laughs> No, other than the dimensions that we approached, I don't have any conjecture in, in, in any other dimension. Well, but my students, Felipe, Felipe Gonçalves is also a wizard in, uh, in computing methods. I mean, it was actually very impressive that the, well, the, this condition here, this conjecture here comes from the sphere packing from the, because the solution of the sphere packing in dimension two is known to be this hexagonal thing. So this would be the number that would actually prove the sphere packing with these methods, okay? So this is not so impressive to get this conjecture, but this is impressive to even get a conjecture like this, that the solution in one is actually this number. This was in this work of uh, Philippe Gonçalves, Diogo Oliveira Silva and Jean Pedro Ramos. They do some uh, discretization of the problem and they, they take a certain discretized version of the problem when, when, and when they send the parameter to infinity, things seem to be converging to this thing. And they went on this, uh, in the internet, there is a table of all the numbers of integer sequences. Have you ever visited this thing? If you plug in any number, 2.7292, if you want to know that there's a known number, just go there and plug in this number and maybe it will appear. Oh, this number is uh, the golden ratio squared divided by pi. You know? And actually they, they plugged in the number and there was only one hit on this massive website, which was this number, one over the square root of the golden ratio, the number that they were converging to. So it's kind of conjecture that this is the, the right answer, but this is also an open problem. So let's thank Manuel. Gracias,